I guess most of us Norwegians are familiar with Hamar uh, and by now, but uh, we weren't uh, 10 years ago. Uh, Mari probably will say something about that. Uh, arts and crafts people in Norway or Kunstland like you were, but the rest of us were not. We were not taught in Hamar when we went to... I was not taught at Hamar at all when I went to the academy in Oslo. I actually never heard her name until a couple of students of mine like seven, eight years ago, came and introduced me to Hanna Ryggen, and I felt very infuriated that uh, she was kept away from the fine arts department. She was one of the most significant Scandinavian artists of the 20th century. Her tapestries are visual responses to major and minor events, conflicts and processes. She captured the world in her weaving, in the early 1930s, she addressed fascism and the destructive consequences of Nazi power. Violence and abuse are visualized in an idiom rem reminiscent of modern critical history, history painting. Um, then, Moira Polska is an uh, independent art critic, curator and writer based here in Oslo. And she also, as most of, most of you or some of you should know, uh, wrote the book Hanna Ryggen and Fri, which won the Critics Awards for the, non, the best nonfiction uh, book of two, uh, 2016. And it's actually going to be translated and published in English by Thames and Hudson in October 2019. <laughs> Thank you, Lotte. And also thank you for inviting me here to speak about the Swedish Norwegian artist Hanna Ryggen. Uh, and I will try to draw up some possible links between the two of them. But often when I begin to explain who Hanna Ryggen was and what kind of art she made, I notice my audience attention wanes as soon as I say that she was a weaver and lived in a remote coastal area in the central Norway called Örlanda. A measure of curiosity returns, however, when I mention that in protest against Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia in 1935, she wove a tapestry in which she depicted Mussolini's head impaled on a spear. And you can see it here in the upper right corner. And furthermore, that the tapestry was censored when shown at the 1937 Paris Expo out of fear of offending the Italian authorities. They literally folded over the portion containing Mussolini's skewed head. When I then continue with the fact that she wore gru, or horror, which is about Franco's havoc in Spain in 1936, one year before Picasso painted Guernica, people usually want to hear more. Well, her art is highly original in its combining international modernism with politics and folk art, and Riggen was in the Norwegian context, unique in parlaying art into activism. Her art accommodates everything from eco-philosophical reflections and ideas about motherhood to critiques of privilege, abuse of power, and social hierarchy. Uh, one of the things that I like the most about Hanna Riggen's art is how explicitly she shows that in her, in her case, life and art were truly one and the same. There is no separating the two. She used herself and her life in her art, and art was her voice. And as I will show you, she was not afraid to use it. Now, embracing the idea of the um, under-recognized female artist has become a popular international trend in recent years. We see this in the revitalized interest in the careers of Hilma of Klint, Paula Madoson Becker, Sonja Delaunay, Carol Rama, and Elsa von Freitag-Loringhofen. And I 
I do support this work because I think it is a correction of an extremely male-dominated um, account of modernism. Yet it is also interesting to note um, how in lifting female artists out of obscurity and focusing attention on their greatness, we almost automatically assume that these women were marginalized or overlooked in their own time. And I assumed that as well when I started um, researching for my book on Hanna Ryggen and Fri. Yet, when I sat down uh, and went through the archival material, it proved otherwise. As opposed to many of her female artist colleagues, Ryggen was declared a genius. And she was so by a number of art critics, male critics, in the 1930s. She exhibited on a regular basis internationally, and her success was indisputable. In other words, she was no misunderstood or marginalized artist, not in her own time anyway. But what was shocking was how little place she was allotted in the written Norwegian artist historical record, record later on. Uh, and especially in art historical survey books from the 1980s and 90s. But that's a topic for an entirely different lecture. So uh, instead, I will start, turn back to um, 1894. And she was born in the Swedish city called Malmö. She grew up in a working class household and um, was initially trained to be a primary school teacher. Teaching, however, did not agree with her. Um, much suggests that the major Baltic exhibition in Malmö in 1913 inspired her to explore art. And here you see an image of her as a teacher. She does not look so happy. Um, This is her access card to the Baltic exhibition, which allowed her to see it uh, every day during the exhibition period. Uh, the exhibition featured vanguard Russian, Swedish and German paintings. And visitors could experience such works as Vasily Kadinsky's composition number no. six from 1913 and many examples of the um, German Expressionism from the Brücke artists, as well as a large selection of applied arts work and Swedish handicrafts. And this is from the section devoted to the Swedish handicraft. And they had this old woman sitting by the loom, weaving during the entire exhibition period. Um, it was very popular. Three years later, in 1916, Hanna Ryggen began studying with Fredrik Krebs, a Danish portrait painter living in a Swedish city called Lund. Employed at that time as a teacher, every day after work, she took the train from Malmö to Lund to study freehand drawing, mixing pigments, composition and perspective along with other students. And she also received an introduction to art history and cultural history. And here she is, sitting in the front. And you see, uh, here's her teacher, Frederik Krebs. And uh, the other ones are the artists she hung out with, the students. And these are examples of uh, freehand drawings from that period. It's a self-portrait from a sketchbook from around 1918. It's a study of a landscape. And I also wanted to show you one of her early oil paintings that I discovered during my research period. Uh, it's a study of a bird. It's from 1918, uh, and as you see, she was trained in a naturalist style. Uh, Mr. Krebs, he loved Rembrandt, 
But uh, Hannah Riggin was uncomfortable with what she felt was an outdated mode of expression. And we can see a glimpse of the transformation of her style of the sorry. And we can see a glimpse of the transformation her style went through when she started weaving at Erlana. And this is a sketch from for a pattern on a pillow made around 1925. Uh, the pattern is called uh, the Northern Lapwing, eller Vipa på norsk. Okay, so in 1922, Frederick Krebs uh, recommended that Ryggen travel to Dresden to study the old masters and further develop her technical skill as a painter. During this tour, she also met her husband-to-be, the Norwegian painter Hans Ryggen. They married in the autumn of 1923 and she moved late in pregnancy to Ørlandet, a flat, very windswept coastal region in the middle of Norway in February 1924. And here you see him sitting in the kitchen, a farmer and a painter. Now, while Hannah Riggen was no sheltered aristocrat, Life in Ørlandet was still a far cry from the city life in Malmö. And Rennan, or the shack, as they lovingly christened their little house that Hans had built, it had no running water, no electricity before 1944. And on the farmland, they cultivated grain, grew vegetables and kept livestock. And it was in these Spartan conditions that Hanna gave birth to her daughter, Mona, in May. And here you see them in June 1924. Now, what little free time they had while running a small farmstead, they used to pursue their art. And from the letters Hans and Hanna uh, exchanged, we know that Hanna decided as early as 1923 before she's arriving at, at Ørlandet, that she wanted to give up painting and begin weaving instead. So, and in doing so, she ensured her place in the art historical record. Now, when Hanna Riggen chose weaving, she did so in a country which houses one of Europe's finest collection of old tapestries going all the way back to this one, the famous Baldis Hul, from around 1150. And we also have several works from the late 1500s. Some are clearly inspired by Flemish tapestries. Um, no, sorry. With a naturalistic and a three-dimensional expression, as a quite similar to the Renaissance painting. And this one depicts a historical scene. It's from around 1600 and belongs to the National Museum here in Oslo. However, this uh, new and more advanced technique never really got a foothold in Norway. It was, a, it was a traditional style with the use of two dimensional planes stacked on top of each other, juxtaposed color fields and distinct drawing of figures that prevailed, like this one. And in this tradition, ornament and pattern and color are the most important elements. And this one is actually a little, um, they think it is from 1650 to around 1750, they don't know exactly. But it also belongs to the National Museum in Oslo. From around 1850, uh, and onwards, leading intellectuals in this country started working for establishing Norway as an independent nation. Tales, sagas and folk art got to play an important role. And around the beginning of the new century, around 1900, the Lysaker Circle, a loose gathering of artists and intellectuals, were particularly inspired by these traditions, which helped them to construct a certain specific uh, Norwegian tradition. And they developed concepts like Norwegian colors, Norwegian motives, 
as a kind of Norwegian decorative style. And I will say that the Lysaki Circle tried in its own way to develop a kind of bourgeois nationalism of the 19th century and to establish Norway as a modern independent cultural nation through the use of distinct symbols. But among Norwegian artists, there, were, there was, of course, um, disputing views of how to express the national, in particular between Erik Wernschol and Gerard Münter, who belonged to the Lysaki circle, and the cosmopolite Christian Krog. Krog claimed that the national was not inherit, inherent in art itself or part of art's nature, but merely the result of tradition. Uh, Münter, on the other hand, considered the national as rooted deep inside the nature of art. And he also wrote that the physio physiognomy of Norwegian colors is so strong that it cannot be swayed by foreign influence. Oh no, they withstand the layers of ideas through the times. In other words, the Norwegian colors of Münter constitute the essence of the Norwegian. They represent a static, imperishable quality. And in a magazine from 1896, Munte writes as follows about the typical Norwegian impression. And I will see. This is the Norwegian original. It's really hard to translate, but I will try. Blackberries from bird cherry in its red foliage. The red of farmhouses against blue vadmel, it's vodmel, it's a um, coarse woolen cloth. Blue goats running among spruce buds, birds carrying roven berries in their beaks, and also living room recollections with pale apples against a black background. Yeah. According to the historian Budl Stenset, uh, the cultural views of the Lysaki circle were based on a romantic idea of a perishing peasant or folk culture. And it was characterized by simplicity in both form and content. The Lysaki circle considered this peasant culture as a representation of the Norwegian um, culture and values and a kind of common consciousness. It also appealed to the Lysaki circle that practical and aesthetical qualities were equal in folk art and that there was a wide exchange of expressions between arts and crafts. Yeah, and the arts and crafts movement were born around 1860. And one of its founders was the impressive and multi-skilled William Morris, as you have heard about and who became also later an activist and dedicated socialist quite late, in, quite late in life, at the age of 49. And as we heard, he was no armchair socialist, even if his father left him a fortune. And he actually, he wrote, he wrote a short essay called How I Became a Socialist in 1894. And it's, uh, I found it in this book. You can come and look at it afterwards if you like. Uh, but in 1894, it's the same year as Hannah is born, which is well worth, yeah, sorry. Um, and Morris was clearly influenced by the famous art critic John Ruskin, who, is in, who in his work insisted on the links that bind a nation's art to health, its economic and social arrangements. And I think Morris do much of the same. And Nikolai Pevsner states that what raises Morris as a reformer of design above the best of his contemporaries is not only that he had a true designer's genius and they had not, but also that he recognized the indissoluble, no, indissoluble, indissoluble unity of an age and its so social system, which they had not done. Morris held that the burden of industrialism and capitalism was destroying nature and environment, as well as the crafts, knowledge and ethics of mankind. During industrialization, man became estranged from the material 
and from knowledge. A similar attitude was held by the Lysaki circle. They were quite critical against technology and thought city life was corrupting and caused one to lose contact with one's soul. And of course, I didn't live in the city by themselves. At that time, Lysake, which was the name of the area they lived, was an idyllic rural, rural area by the Oslo Fjord. Now, I find it very interesting that, Hanna, that when Hanna Ryggen chose weaving, she also chose, chose, chose a medium that had been strongly tied to um, the building of Norway as a nation. The Lysake Circle was not only a group of artists, it also consisted of writers and academics and scientists, such as Fritjof Nansen, the historian Ernst Saar and the art historian Andreas Aubert. Their meetings were often held in their homes at Lysake, and the decoration of their homes, these homes was an integrated and important park, part of the work of the movement and likely also became symbol of status. Design was considered one of the arts and the artists were mostly men, also when it com came to home design. Uh, and that's quite interesting actually to see that the conception of home decoration as a feminine domain came later. Hanna and Hans Riggen were inspired by the idea that artists should decorate their own homes like William Morris had done with the Red House in 1861, or as Karl Larsson or Gerard Munte did a few decades later. And Karl Larsson, the Swedish artist, he, had his, he published his book called Et Hem, A Home, uh, in, in 1897. And this book uh, was filled with watercolors and it became immensely popular in the Nordic countries and had a strong impact also in Norway. And I actually found a German, I found a copy of the later German edition called Das Haus in der Sonne in Hans and Hanna's remains. So they must have bought it when they were in Dresden in 1922. And I wanted to show you some of the watercolors from this book. And of course, I mean, we almost know them by heart. Um, this is the window. And, and all of these I'm showing you now stems from the period between 1894 to 1899. And they all belong to the National Museum in, in Stockholm. It's the window, and this is called When the Children Has Gone to Bed. Uh, and this is called Cozy Corner. Now, what's interesting, I mean, these were usually popular. Um, and Gerard Munter, the Norwegian artist, and one of also one of the most prominent artists connected to the Lysake circle, he was clearly inspired by Larsson and his tremendous success. And in 19... Oh, 09. He shows a series of watercolors in uh, Christiania Kunstverening, Christiania Art Society, and he includes several of these as illustrations for his essay to decorate one's home in 1913. And this become, I mean, it became so popular in Norway. And I will show you. I mean, it's it feels like a kind of ripoff <laughs> of, of uh, Larsson. And his, uh, his home was called Leav Eld. And here you see the Norwegian blue and, and the Norwegian red. It's from 1902, yes. Interior from, from Leav Eld. And here you see the drawing room. And the living room with a fireplace. Now, in his essay, To Decorate One's Home, Munter claims that he has read many books on the subject of home decoration, 
which have left him cold and disinterested because they seem, I'm quoting, important and fail to appeal to Norwegian life and conditions. Quote ended. Instead, Munter promoted the old peasant culture, the impact of which he describes vividly in a scene, and I will read this aloud, and you have the Norwegian edition here. I cannot forget the emotional impact it had on a lady when I led her into a um, Hallingdal living room. As a Hallingdal is an area in Norway. At once she felt how the value of tradition, old experience and local art was so well fitting to the conditions and work of the people from that place. It was also quite much easier times in which to form a home, not only for the little people, but also for the landowners even in the cities, as they were small and country-like. Uh, now, this statement shows that Munter did not refrain from romanticizing simple living conditions. While, of course, his own house was, as we have seen, far from simple or spartan. And the contrast is quite remarkable if we compare Munter's watercolors with the photographs from the interior of Hans and Hanna's home in the 1920s. Their house was small and they had almost no money. Uh, so Hans made all the furniture himself and they painted the cupboards and stairs and ceiling and Hannah's tapestries hung on the wall and she had made rugs for floors and pillows for the sitting furniture. So they really took pride in making their own home. And I wanted to show you Yeah, he's, he's uh, dealing with herring here, uh, but back on the stairs you see how he has painted it. And um, here Hannah is washing their child, Mona, and you can also see here the cupboards is painted. And one of the tapestries of Hannah is on the wall here, behind Hans. And here you see the house from the outside. Um, with Hannah is reading and Mona is playing and Hans is painting there in the background. Now, while William Morris revived several long forgotten crafts and skills and taught himself a number of skills as well, weaving included, Few of the fa few <laughs> few of the fa male artists connected to the Lysaki circle carried out handicrafts themselves. Even Gerard Munter never made this effort. To make his celebrated tapestries, Munter was completely dependent on female weavers. He only drew or painted the cartoons. Still, thanks to the movements like the Lysaki circle and arts and crafts handicrafts or folk art had got a pr quite prominent position in the early 1900s. Tapestry was one of the crafts which position was restored through the activities of the Lysaki Circle and its promotion of Norwegian colors, the Norse mythology and also medieval expression. And here you see one of Muntes. Yeah, it's from 1892. So William Morris was also very interested in folklore and mythology from Northern Europe, as Karin said. And he studied Icelandic in England, translated several Icelandic sagas, and also Heimskringla. And he looked to this literature for the timeless and symbolic patterns of human experience, which we find in myth, in folk literature, and in dreams. And also, as mentioned before, he went to visit Iceland in 1871 and 1873. And after the last journey, he came home politicized. Uh, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about this afterwards. But I find this coexistence in Murray's works of uh, revolutionary politics 
on one hand and nostalgic romance on the other, quite puzzling. <laughs> Even if the Lysaki circle was clearly influenced by the arts and craft movement, Münter rejected this strongly. He stated that all similarities were just coincidental or superficial. No, Norway should not look to England, it should look to France, the rich and wealthy France, and an artist like Eugène Grasset. And I'll quickly show you what kind of uh, images he made. Very decorative, art nouveauish illustrations. And this is uh, the, uh, an angel greetings card from 1896, 96, I think. And this is a cover he made for Harper's Magazine uh, in 1892. Hanna Ryggen shared Morris's political view and also his interest in, in folk art. What she didn't share was his idea of art and craft being one and the same, or his or Munter's affection for nostalgic romance. So when she first came to Erlanda, Hanna Ryggen made and sold craft items as a source of income, but she stopped doing so in 1933. Meanwhile, the large-scale weavings were extremely time-consuming and labor-intensive, and art was for a very long time an economic drain on the family. I found documents showing that during the 14 years from 1926 to 1940, Riggen earned a total of 3,000 Norwegian crowns for, from her tapestries. And in comparison, a yearly, um, a yearly salary in 1930 was around 2,500 crowns. She made 3,000 in 14 years. And yet, despite extremely difficult means, Riggen never compromised. Not only did she, did she give up making and selling crafts, she also refused to sell her monumental weavings to private buyers. She wanted her works to be public statements. And for that reason, she felt that they should be publicly owned and hang where all citizens had access to them. And she writes in a letter to her friend Andreas Scholdager in 1937. I can never imagine I will make a living from the tapestries I make. Political tapestries for rich people. That is a parody. If I lived in a work estate, my paintings would at best be decorating schools and meeting halls. I would not receive great sums of money, but I would have food for my hard labor and perhaps a couple of free journeys each year and electric lights and a bathroom. That's what I think. The way it is now, we would be starving without our small patch of land and a cow. In this situation, the likes of me are not needed. And all art is regarded as luxury. Uh, so what happened was that in 1923, Riggen brought all of her painter's knowledge and political fervor to bear in her weaving. It took her a decade, 10 years, to master the medium, composition, often with respect to an outside scale, carding, spinning, weaving techniques, and not least, making dyes from plants. Extracting colors from the natural terrain that surrounded her and controlling the sophisticated chemical processes that rendered color stables o stable over time was the result of laborious experiment experimentations. But once she had this knowledge at her fingertips, she felt free to express herself. And it was not decorative patterns or motives a la Münter or Grasset, she set in the warp, but challenging national and international political issues of the day.
And the first truly successful monumental tapestry that Hanna Ryggen created was Fishing in the Sea of Depth from 1933. And the subject is the harsh social conditions and consequences of the devastating economic crisis that struck Norway and many other countries in the 1930s. During the worst year, 1933, over one third of the organized workforce was unemployed. Several were ruined by overwhelming, overwhelming debt, and fishermen, many of them in Erlanda, were among the hardest hit. And Riggen found the injustice of this situation, that banks prospered on people's insolvency, to be intolerable. And she states in one of her letters that every man and woman, I know I quote, whether rich or poor, ought to be raised capable of two things, producing their own food and supporting themselves. It is an indignity that some serve others. Everyone should work. No one should be above another. Equality for all mankind. We are all flesh and blood, just the same. So the farm and livestock were the lifeblood of this little family. And Hanna loved her animals. And she also convinced her cousins in Sweden to um, send her goose eggs. And she actually managed to hatch them with the help of an obliging turkey. Uh, and here we see her, she's sitting uh, with the goslings. And look at the way that she held this full-grown goose in her arm. And this is a tapestry called We and Our Animals from 1934. And it's a collection of uh, Malmö Art Museum in Sweden. And it's nearly two by five meters. And uh, here Riggen uh, abandoned her early attempts to achieve smooth transitions between use. Instead, the composition is built up around uh, large color fields. And we find this portrait of the little family, which Riggen herself described in these words, and I quote, this is us with our fool, Nussa, cow, Metta, the two sheep, Kakileje, the gander, and the turkey. I had 10 geese. We slaughtered all of them at the same time, and I haven't eaten goose since. It is to their memory I have woven this tapestry. Quote ended. So being dependent on nature was actually something Hanna Riggen clearly experienced, in contrast to Gerard Muntes' more romanticized view on nature and the physio physiognomy of Norwegian colors. And then comes the Second World War, and as we have seen, Hanna Ryggen took an early stance at uh, stance against the political development in Europe. I've already mentioned uh, Ethiopia from 1935, and you see she depicts Mussolini's head skewed on a black man's spare, leaving no ambigu ambiguity to her standpoint. All she wanted was Mussolini dead. And we have this one, Death of Dreams from 1936. And this is her defense of Karl von Ossietzky and protest against Hitler, Goebbels and Göring. And the impetus for the work was the Ossietzky case and the Third Reich increasingly more brutal and inhumane um, system of governance. The day after the Reichstag fire in Berlin in 1933, Ossietzky, along with many other opposition activists, were, was again imprisoned and charged with high treason. And tolerance for criticism of the Nazis was by this time essentially nil. So with Ossietzky's fate, the political consequences of Hitler's government drew close to, or closer to Norway. And in the upper section of the tapestry, we see Ossietzky's, Ossietzky handcuffed and behind bars here. 
and together with the other prisoners. And to Osievsky's right, you have uh, Goebbels, Göring and Hitler. And they form this sinister triumvirate propped on swastikas. And their faces and hands are run up in purple, the color of madness with a trace of crimson. And Goebbels, he clasps his hands around the throat of the prisoner who hangs helpless in his clutch. And to the prisoner's right, here you see um, Albert Einstein uh, standing with a violin in his hand. And Einstein was a prominent opponent of the Third Reich and contributed in nominating Osiecki for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1935. And he was not awarded it until 1936, uh, a decision which caused a lot of stir. And Osiecki's name was frequently mentioned in the Norwegian press in these years and became a very powerful symbol of resistance. So with Death of Dreams, Hanna Riggen walked straight into a political discussion that was consuming the entire newspaper world, numerous authors and also many ordinary citizens. And she wrote this about the work, and I quote, Woven in 1936, three years after Hitler came to power, I called it Death of Dreams because no all the dreams were going to die. And this is Lieselotte Hermann beheaded. And Lieselotte Hermann was a female German communist and a student at the University of Stuttgart and politically active in the Rote Studentenbund, also the Red Student League. In 1933, Hermann's husband, who was also politically active, was murdered by Gestapo, and from then on, she worked illegally. And she was pregnant when her husband was killed, and in 1934, she gave birth to a son. No, yeah, sorry. And this son was uh, named Walter. And shortly thereafter, she threw her supporter, Stefan Lovac, one of the leaders of the communist milieu in Württemberg, in the struggle against the Nazis. And in Hannah's tapestry, we see Liselotte here seated with her child on the lap in a garden-like idyllic surroundings, not unlike a Madonna in the rose garden motif. Yet the path from bliss to imprisonment was short, visualized by the single footprint in the direction of the cell. You see it here. On the 7th December of 1935, the then 20-year-old Liselotte Hermann was arrested by the Nazis who accused her of high treason. She was imprisoned for 19 months before her case came up before the so-called People's Court or Volkgerichthof. And during this period, Walter lived with his grandparents. Now in Norway and also in the other European countries, there was several women's organizations who advocated for her freedom. But in 1937, Liselotte was sentenced to death. And in Hannah's weaving, we see her alone in her cell here. And she's clasping Walter's clo clothing close to her ch chest. And she was guillotined or beheaded 20th of June in 1938. In 1939, the Nazis occupied Norway, and the presence was keenly felt by those living in Ørlande in Trøndelag. As a hub in the middle of Norway, the region was of great strategic importance for the Nazis. And in his memoir, uh, Inside the Third Reich, Albert Speer wrote that Hitler had ambitious plans. The central city of Trondheim would become home to the third largest naval, naval base of the Third Reich, and the airport has to, was to be built at Ørlande. And it was built. And it was built uh, primarily with Russian and Ser Serbian prisoners of war, labor. 
and the wartime acts of aggression played out with frightening clarity in front of Hans and Hanna's eyes. They witnessed torture and long processions of emaciated prisoners past the house on their way to forced labor. And they just found these photographs, actually, from uh, Ørlande. And I can just imagine how hard the winters were. And then, quite literally, a bit of light shone in the dark age, because in 1944, electricity was installed at the Czech. And after years of cursing the paraffin lamps and the long dark winters that made the weaving so difficult, Riggen was elated. But happiness was soon overshadowed by a new catastrophe. Hans Riggen was arrested by the Nazis in May 1944 and imprisoned, first at Falsta, outside of Trondheim, and later Grini, for having perpetrated illegal acts, and that is to say for having helped prisoners of war to escape. And uh, Hanna now found herself alone with all the farm work and maintaining their property. And she writes in one of her letters, all of our fields are full of weeds and I have to clean potatoes and peas outdoors and indoors. No, sorry, outdoors and inside. It is all work, never dreaming. Uh, and Hannah depicted her separation from Hans in the beautiful and dreamlike Grini tapestry, which she began working on early in 1945. The palette is predominantly shades of red, and Hans Riggen is positioned such that his, as his left arm, the one he's painting with, he was left-handed, is positioned in the golden section. And he is wearing a prisoner's uniform on which his number 13243 is prominently displayed. And he sits and paints skull and crossbone signs with the Nazis positioned in. Sorry, the Nazis pos posted in minefields. Here is the green tapestry. Sorry, I thought I had changed, but I hadn't. Along the far right edge of the work, Riggen has woven in column-like structure from which several faces peer out. And directly above Hans, here, more worn faces appear behind a barbed, white barbed wire fence. They are looking at him. And from the left side of the tapestry, Muna comes riding on a horseback, as if in a dream or a folk tale. She's nude, except for a swath of flowers she holds in her hands, and a similar floral pattern appears under the horse's hooves. And behind Mona, there is an open window where we see a house and a landscape, and perhaps this is the shack and Erlana, and a flowery field stretches beyond the rooftops, like a kind of a floral sky. So through her messenger, the daughter, Hannah bestows the dream, the ability to imagine, on Hans. She seeks to pry open a way out of the enclosure. And not long after, Germany capitulated and Hans was released. Now, several episodes from wartime Norway would make their way into Riggen's weaving in the years before peace. And I do not have time to talk about all of them. But I wanted to mention one that occurred in the autumn of 1942 when the Nazis tightened their grip on the county in the middle of Norway called Trøndelag. A new declaration of martial law was announced on 6th of October and Reichskommissioner Commissioner Josef Tarboven had received a list of 15 persons from which 10 were to be selected and executed as a symbolic demonstration of the futility of resistance against the occupation. And Tarboven had ensured that men of a certain stature were chosen.
but the day before. 6th of October, Hanna Ryggen went to Trendelag Theatre and saw a dress rehearsal of Henrik Ibsen's play, The Wild Duck. The role of Dr. Relling was played by the theatre's director, Henry Gledic. And he must have had an ulterior, ulterior motive in choosing to stage a play where such concepts as reality and truth are truly put to the test. Now, The Wild Duck was meant to premiere on the 17th of October, but just before the dress rehearsal started, Gledic was taken into custody by the Nazis because his name was on the list. He was one of the 10 that was to be executed. And on the morning of the 7th October in 1942, the death sentence was served upon the 10 political prisoners in the forest, in a forest outside of Trondheim, and they were shot. And what's interesting is that this, um, the premiere was postponed and held on the 20th of October. And colleagues took over the role of uh, Henry Gledic and his wife. And the entire run of The Wild Duck was sold out. But after every performance that autumn, something quite unique occurred. The audience did not applaud. Instead, everyone rose and collectively, collectively observed a minute of silence before leaving the theater. And what Hannah Riggen does is that she incorporates Gledic's murder and the fate of the sacrifice scapegoats in her large work entitled 6th of October in 1942. And it's from the year after, from 1943. And the imagery is a fusion of news photos, visual impressions and imaginations. She utilized elements from diverse sources, ascribed them new colors, and placed them together in such a way that the imagery that was resonated and remained in her mind's eye. She had developed this unique compositional method over some time. And as early as 1937, she wrote a letter to her friend, the architect Helge Thies, and wrote, I quote, what is dream and what is reality for me? It all becomes enchanced in the mixing, quote ended. And that the mix is unique, is undeniable. Her diary entries reveals that the colors also played an important role. They often fostered the composition. And once the entire image sat well enough, she could begin to weave. But the, the composition had to be visually arresting because she relied solely on what she had in her mind, and she did not resort to sketches or patterns. New elements occasionally emerged while she worked, but there was no hierarchy of meaning or rules that governed the surface composition. She freely combined them, and she combined elements from collage, from photographs, and folk art. She followed the weaving's own logic and limitations. How weft meets warp, respect for the surface, and development of form with the help of triangles, a method one also find in Coptic weaving. And in the scene to the right, here, we see the Riggen family at sea. And uh, the boat that they are in is black, like death, but they are surrounded by red roses symbols of hope and beauty. And uh, Mona, here, she holds um, uh, binoculars, and Hans sits in the middle holding a rolled up canvas or tapestry, while Hanna grasps the horn of a cow, suggestion, a suggestion perhaps of reluctance to let go of Erlana. And three heads floats above them here, and the face in the middle bears a strong likeness to Terborens, and the one to the right resembles Jonas Lee, who was the chief police under Terboren, and responsible for the police tribunal and the one who authorized death sentences against Norwegians during the war. 
and the face to the left could be that of Heinrich Christens, who was among the, those responsible for the death sentence against Gledic. And notice how this um, trio echoes the death of Hitler, Göring and Goebbels in Death of Dreams. The tapestry's midsection was woven separately and subsequently attached to the left and right section. And it is noticeable from a purely compositional perspective. Uh, Riggen herself has indicated that the left and right portions were woven first. However, they did not function well enough as a whole together. And in terms of the coloration, she felt that a measure of red was called for to balance the two part. And thus wove the middle section uh, where Winston Churchill stands guard over his country in an orange-red fortress tower, holding a map of England in his hand. And he stands like a bulwark. To the left, tragedy takes place, as if on stage. The mortally wounded actor and theatre director Henry Gledic, in costume as Dr. Lelling from The Wild Duck, lies in his wife's arms. Sunova Gledic is also in costume, and she's kneeling behind. She's kneeling beside her husband. Their positions are evocative of a pieta, and the reference is intensified by the presence of a naked man bounded to a post behind them. The figure is not, however, a Christ figure, but rather a Serbian prisoner of war who Rigen personally witnessed being tortured and executed at a, as a, at a concentration camp nearby. And she described the event like this, and I quote, the Serbs were tortured and tied to posts for having stolen bread and left there naked overnight. And in the morning, the Germans broke their necks. Above them, Hitler with his pistol floats like an omnipresent devil. And the shots fired strike Gledic, Nurigen ridicules Hitler, depicting him with oak leaves coming out of his anus. And oak leaves uh, were a well-known symbol used by the Nazis on the military decorations. So variations of oak leaves were also commonly used on the uniform shirts to indicate rank. And uh, Riggen also derides the famous Norwegian author Knut Hamsun and the traitor Widkun Quisling and they are portrayed as pitiful blackbirds flying around Hitler. <coughs> this tapestry demonstrates Hannah Riggen's ability to combine personal experiences with a passionate political seal, as well as her extreme fearlessness. She never hesitated in displaying her allegiances through visual statements. And according to one of her close friends, Riggen hung this tapestry on the side of her house so that the German soldiers would see it whenever they marched past with their prisoners. Yeah, time to end maybe. Uh, in a public discussion between Siri Hustvet and uh, Chris Krauss at Literaturhuset earlier this autumn in Oslo, one of them referred to the significance of uh, rage without depression. And uh, this is something I find truly emblematic of uh, in Hannah Riggen's art. She had this enormous confidence in art. With art, she was capable of saying anything. She also relied on the impact of raising one's voice. And you know, politics is always focused on the future where its consequences lay. And Morris did notice that and wrote somewhere that, and I quote, if others can see it as I have seen it, then it may be called a vision rather than a dream. And I think William Morris and Hannah Regan shared almost the same dream. But Hannah's artistic legacy reminds us that art is also a, an active part of public life. It can actually change things. Thank you.